April 9, 1998, the Herrig Brothers Poultry Farm, Albert City, Iowa. Two teenagers were joyriding on an ATV when they crashed into piping from a 42-foot-long propane storage tank. Propane gushed from the tank. An excess flow valve failed to stop the leak. The gas likely drifted toward a hot propane vaporizer 37 feet away and ignited. Flames engulfed the tank and began to heat the propane inside. 20 volunteer firefighters were called to the scene, but were unable to stop the leak. They planned to let the fire burn itself out. But meanwhile, they would spray down the adjacent turkey barns to keep the fire from spreading. Based on their training and guidance, the firefighters believed that in the event of an explosion, they would be protected if they stayed away from the ends of the burning tank. As the fire continued to rage, flames directly heated the upper section of the tank wall above the level of the liquid. Without liquid to transfer the heat, the upper section of the tank wall began to overheat and weaken. Minutes later, the propane tank blew apart, sending metal fragments in all directions. Pieces of the tank struck the firefighters, killing two. Other deadly fragments narrowly missed two others. Seven firefighters were injured. Other debris smashed into buildings. The firefighters were victims of a blevy, a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion, a hazard they had never trained or prepared for. This accident resulted from a lack of effective training materials for firefighters, as well as a lack of understanding of propane blevy hazards. If the firefighters had just kept a safe distance away from the burning tank, no one would have been harmed. And that's really the tragedy of this case. Chemical Safety Board investigations have revealed that many communities, companies, and responders need to be more knowledgeable and better prepared. Gent, West Virginia. Two emergency responders and two technicians are killed when propane explodes and destroys a convenience store. Dalton, Georgia. Police and EMTs drive into a toxic vapor cloud that forces them to retreat and leaves them injured. Danvers, Massachusetts. Residents, authorities, and firefighters are caught by surprise when an ink manufacturing plant near a quiet neighborhood blows up in the middle of the night. Chemical accidents like these present unique challenges to planning officials and responders. The CSB has found recurring difficulties in three key areas, training, communications, and community planning. You have to understand the hazard. On the morning of January 30th, 2007, an inexperienced technician prepared to transfer propane between two tanks at a convenience store in rural Gent, West Virginia. Suddenly, a geyser of propane erupted from one of the tanks. A large cloud of flammable vapor formed behind the store and seeped inside through vents in the roof. The invisible gas began to fill the store. The technician was unable to stop the release. All four employees remained inside the store, and the technician stayed by the tank as propane continued to leak for nearly half an hour. Meanwhile, two volunteer firefighters, two emergency medical technicians, and a second propane technician arrived in the danger zone. The area was never evacuated. At 10.53 a.m., the propane found an undetermined ignition source and exploded. The two technicians, the volunteer fire captain, and an EMT standing near the leaking tank were killed. The four store employees and the other firefighters survived, but they sustained serious burns and other injuries. Nearly 30 minutes elapsed between the release and the explosion. 
if there had been an evacuation during those 30 minutes, all of the lives would have been saved. The CSB found the volunteer firefighters and the propane technicians were not adequately trained to handle propane emergencies. If you see that vapor cloud and you hear it and you smell it, you need to be leaving it alone and you need to evacuate the area. CSB investigations illustrate the tragic consequences when workers and responders don't take appropriate defensive actions and risk their lives attempting to save structures or equipment. We take the vow to protect life and property. Life comes first. On April 12, 2004, first responders and residents in Dalton, Georgia, were not prepared to deal with the aftermath of an accident at MFG Chemical. A runaway chemical reaction overpressurized a vessel, releasing highly toxic allyl alcohol and allyl chloride vapor into the community. The toxic vapor quickly spread into the residential neighborhood east of the facility. Firefighters rushed to the site of what they believed was a simple chemical spill. They were not anticipating or expecting a vapor cloud release into the community. When the fire department approached the scene, the first fire truck actually drove through a vapor cloud and they were affected by the chemical. The CSB found the town had not trained or equipped its emergency responders for such an accident. Police drove into the cloud to evacuate families, but then had to retreat. So did ambulance personnel. The fire department had never planned for or conducted any drills associated with a toxic release from a facility. If you're a first responder and get injured yourself, you're not going to be able to help other victims if you're lying in the back of an ambulance on a stretcher. August 14, 2002, Festus, Missouri. A transfer hose from a chlorine rail car burst at the DPC Enterprises plant. The CSB found that a lack of adequate planning and training delayed the response and increased the severity of the accident. When the release started, the chlorine gas engulfed the protective gear that was stored nearby. Without that gear, workers could not access the manual shutoff valves on top of the rail car, and they had no choice but to flee the plant. Volunteer hazmat responders were finally able to stop the leak, braving the four-foot-deep fog of chlorine to close several manual shutoff valves three hours after the leak began. 63 people from the surrounding community sought medical evaluations for respiratory distress. Three others were admitted to the hospital. Training, planning, exercises, putting appropriate procedures in place so that those responders come home safely at the end of the day is critical. We just have an emergency alarm in progress right now. Do you know what area of the plant or anything? Well, I can't give out any information. I can say we will contact you with the, with the proper information. In August 2008, a chemical explosion occurred at the Bayer Pesticide Plant in Institute, West Virginia. Two workers were fatally injured. Authorities told tens of thousands of residents to shelter in place. Responders struggled to learn what chemicals were involved in the accident and what precautions they should take. We had reports it was in a larvin unit. Are you able to confirm or deny that? Uh, no, that's all. I'm only allowed to tell you that we have an emergency in the plant. At the end of the night, uh, I, I knew no more than I knew driving up Interstate 64, and that was approximately six hours later. CSB investigations show the need for effective communications between companies, responders, and communities, not only during a chemical emergency, but before a disaster strikes. The only way you can approach community preparedness is having a good understanding of the risks that are present in the community. And that means you have to develop communication with everyone who is handling the hazardous chemicals in that community. On November 17, 2003, a six-hour-long chlorine gas release occurred at the DPC Enterprises facility in Glendale, Arizona. 
residents and workers in a one and a half square mile area needed to be evacuated. But the emergency notification system was inadequate. Police officers who did not have respiratory protection went door to door notifying residents. Five officers were among the 16 people who required hospital treatment for chlorine exposure. In the Festus, Missouri chlorine release, there were no sirens or other community-wide alert systems to notify residents and businesses of the emergency. So responders had to drive door to door with bullhorns. I knew they were over there, but with a name like Environmental Quality, I had no idea what their business was. I didn't know that they stored toxic chemicals or oxidizing agents there. I had no idea what was there. Apex, North Carolina, October 5th, 2006. A resident happened to drive by the Environmental Quality Company Hazardous Waste Transfer Facility shortly after one of the storage bays caught fire. He called 911. So you can actually see the haze and then real strong smell. Okay. Firefighters from the Apex Fire Department and other jurisdictions responded. Flames spread quickly burning through the roof and causing numerous 55-gallon drums of waste to burst, sending fireballs hundreds of feet into the air. As the fire spread, an unknown chemical haze began to drift over the town. But the plant manager was unable to tell the fire chief exactly what chemicals were stored at the facility. He said, but I can tell you generally what's in there. You've got large quantities of flammables, combustibles, oxidizers, pesticides, poisons, contaminated lead, contaminated mercury. The only thing I think left out of the nine classifications was miscellaneous. Thousands of residents were ordered to evacuate their homes. About 30 people, including 12 police officers and one firefighter, were taken to local hospitals for respiratory distress and nausea. We were operating strictly on a, a large event of an unknown chemical and erring on the side of safety by going with our worst case scenario plan. Local communities, local jurisdictions have a right and an obligation to know what threats are in their communities so that they would know how to deal with them. Jacksonville, Florida, December 19th, 2007. Firefighters faced a similar situation not knowing all the chemicals involved in a massive explosion and fire at the T2 Laboratories facility. The company had provided officials with an incomplete list. T2 Laboratories produced a highly toxic gasoline additive. On the day of the accident, a runaway chemical reaction ruptured a large processing vessel. The contents ignited, creating a fireball and mushroom cloud that rose some 2,000 feet high dwarfing the towers visible in the foreground of this Coast Guard security video. Surveillance cameras showed the resulting blast wave blowing out windows of nearby businesses and injuring office workers up to 750 feet away. Four workers in the plant were killed. 33 other people were injured. So within 10 minutes on the scene, we had a good grasp of the, the magnitude of the problem. Uh, this facility uh, housed multiple types of chemicals, and for our perspective from, from the hazardous material side, it makes kind of a worst case scenario. I truly was concerned for the safety of the people that work with us. You had cars on fire, you had shrapnel everywhere, you had small explosions continuing to take place, and we just go back and we rely on our training. The response to the T2 explosion by the Jacksonville Fire Department shows the importance of pre-planning, training, and conducting exercises and drills. And the response was very effective with no injuries of any first responders. The key to emergency preparedness is to be aware of what chemical hazards are in your community and where they're located so that you can plan for a proper response. Danvers, Massachusetts, November 22, 2006. A massive explosion at a chemical facility devastated a nearby neighborhood in the middle of the night. The blast wave blew through windows into the bedrooms of sleeping residents, protected only by bed covers as glass shattered and ceilings collapsed. In what some called a miracle, there were no fatalities. 
and only 10 residents were injured, suffering cuts and bruises. CAI, an ink manufacturer, was located on an industrial site where flammable solvents had been stored and used for decades. Yet residents of the Danversport neighborhood, which grew up nearby over the years, were unaware of the potential danger. An operator likely forgot to turn off the steam heating for an ink mixing tank before leaving for the night. The steam continued to heat flammable solvents in the tank for more than eight hours, causing them to boil. Flammable vapor filled the unventilated building and exploded. The fact that a chemical company could cause that much destruction, a small chemical company, uh, is something that surprised, I think, all of us. Local emergency planning committees, or LEPCs, are required under the 1986 Federal Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. The committees provide residents, officials, and emergency responders with a system to prepare for chemical accidents. The Danvers LEPC had not met for years. It was revitalized after the accident by town officials and concerned citizens. And the newly resurrected Danvers LEPC has expanded its largely emergency-based charter to include looking into what we can do to prevent a recurrence of this type of tragedy. At the foot of the Rocky Mountains, the picturesque town of Durango, Colorado, has an active LEPC. Officials and residents plan for possible chemical releases from an oil refinery as well as a highway used to transport hazardous materials. An LEPC functions to make sure that the responders and the community all work together, exercise together, and train together to make for a smoother response. Fundamentally, the power of an LEPC is to ask for information, to go out, get it, and disseminate it to the people that can use it. It's very important that the jurisdictions that don't have LEPCs establish them, and run them on a regular basis. LEPCs work to identify chemical hazards in a community, plan and train for emergencies, and test notification and evacuation procedures. These vital community planning functions can easily be overlooked during years or decades without a major accident. Um, any other hazmat training updates, exercises coming up? We had no idea that this could happen to this company. So just please be aware of what you have in your community. Frankly, every town has facilities in it that are capable of producing very serious accidents that are not well understood by the local community. Have an emergency plan uh, that is flexible enough to adapt to situations as they might arise. Be prepared, take nothing for granted. Planning for risks and hazards and emergency response is a process. It's not an endpoint. Community preparedness is about planning, training, exercises, and repeat and repeat. CSB investigations reveal the continuing need for first responders to have proper hazmat training and equipment, conduct frequent drills and exercises for possible chemical releases, communicate with the companies in their communities that deal with chemicals, and know the key facility contacts in an emergency. Communities should support and maintain an active LEPC, be prepared to evacuate or shelter in place if necessary, and establish multiple communication systems to notify residents of a chemical emergency. Companies should communicate frequently and openly with residents, businesses, and emergency management officials about chemical hazards and train employees to respond properly to chemical emergencies and to evacuate when appropriate. Preparations by companies, emergency responders, government authorities, and the public are critical to reducing injuries and saving lives. It's not only important to be prepared, but everyone must communicate, have an up-to-date plan, and practice that plan regularly. We hope that our findings will help keep communities safe. For more information on CSB investigations, please visit csb.gov. Hey, this is Metro 911. Uh, what do we have? Do you know? We have an emergency at the uh, Bear Crop Science Plant. Right. And the only information I can give you is that we'll, you need, and uh, you might want to alert the community. 
I, uh, my supervisor informed me to tell you to alert the community that there was an emergency uh, in the plant. 911? Yeah. Yes, this is uh, Steve at the main gate. Okay. We need a ambulance uh, uh, immediately okay. uh, for a, a burn. Uh, we have a burn patient. Burn patient, yes. What happened? Do you know? And, uh, well, I can't give out any information until I get uh, my information. Okay. 